Welcome back to The Short Game. This is a show about short video games, games that respect your time. I'm one of your hosts, Reagan Kelly, and I'm joined by all of my awesome co-hosts this week. First off, Shane Kelly, my bro host. How are you doing, Shane? I'm great. Got a new microphone. I hope all of you in the podcast world can hear the wonderful difference. I certainly hope so. We're going to be trying a couple new things with our production this week. If anything sounds funny, bear with us and maybe let me know. Um, That'd be cool because I'm going to be trying some new editing stuff this week, not to go into too much detail. Oh, hey, uh, Nate Heininger, how are you doing, Nate? (laughs) Uh, No, please go on. I'm glad to be here, but I want to hear more about these new editing techniques. Oh, it's very thrilling and laura (laughs) j nash how are you doing laura i am doing great i'm a little bit more into robots this week than podcast editing but that's just me yeah robots robo buddies robots yes this week we're talking about 2064 read only memories a sort of point and click adventure game uh from mid boss which I have to say is a great uh, company name. It is a good company name. And I'm glad you said sort of because it's sort of a point and click. I mean, you look around a room and you can pick up things. But also, most of the time, you're just talking to people. And we think someone said in the chat earlier while we were planning that we've done walking sims. But this is more of a talking sim. <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, it is. This is a game that is... Um, uh, it's a it's a cyberpunk mystery, um, and that mystery plays out almost entirely through um, extended dialogue sequences that you have some control over. I would say stylistically, it's kind of a um, adv- a classic adventure game in that you're collecting uh, the occasional random picking up the occasional random item from the ground and and walking around and talking to people, uh, but it has a lot more going on in the character department than most of those games. Yeah, it's beautiful looking, and I'm sure we'll talk about some of the characters and the art in a minute, but just in terms of gameplay, the thing that it reminded me of the most was actually the Phoenix Wright games. Um, Phoenix Wright has a lot of extended dialogue sequences, um, and you know, the uh, it, crime it's definitely... scene investigation is in there, yeah. Absolutely, mm-hmm. and it's different from your standard adventure game. It's more of the sort of visual novel style. And um, yeah. I didn't have a lot of experience with visual novels until, apart from maybe things like Phoenix Wright, until fairly recently. But um, this really sticks out as sort of that style rather than a sort of Western point-and-click Monkey Island adventure game style. Yeah, and um, that actually kind of made the game click a little bit for me more once somebody, I think it was you, Reagan, pointed out that it is more like a visual novel Um, because I went into this like, okay, it's a point-and-click adventure game, Um, but uh, while there are definitely adventure game elements, the vast majority of the game is just having people talk to each other or talk at you and you selecting from a limited dialogue tree. It does seem to branch um, in some places very wildly. I don't know um, how much it kind of leads back to itself but you definitely have a lot of character choices um but the if you're thinking adventure game like there's going to be a lot of puzzles or things to really solve uh, there is some um but it is often either very very simple seems like just a you know a thing to give you something to do because you haven't done anything for a while um or kind of serving more of the narrative anyway like not any direct puzzles, per se. Yeah, mm-hmm. and this game's been on our radar for a long time. It was in a Kickstarter in 2013. It was released in 2015, but we intentionally were waiting until it uh, relaunched with new voice acting because we knew how much dialogue was in there, and since we knew this big release with uh, suddenly you know, everything you're reading, most of it will suddenly have voices, and it made a huge difference in the game. I can't imagine this without that voice cast yeah i i started this game right the day the day that it came out because um mid boss was kind enough to send us a couple of review codes for it on uh, uh when when the game was initially launching back in october 2015 and we didn't end up doing an episode on it and sorry it took so long yeah guys. sorry it took so long mid boss <laughs> um a big part of that was because i got started with the game and i didn't really get into it and i think it is just because i i went into it expecting a point and click adventure game and ended up getting this uh this very you know text heavy visual novel experience it's got a lot of charm but 
you have to you have to kind of get through uh, past a certain point with it. You know, I think all of us had the experience that the game really starts to kind of open up and and work um, maybe two or three hours in. And I didn't get that far because it was just such a text heavy experience that for whatever reason, I ended up setting it down and not not picking it back up and not going back yeah, to that it kind of that game does, has, I, I always have that kind of experience with this style of game um and it, it's it's the kind of experience i'll have with books as well so like i have when i read a book i have to get 100 pages in before i decide if i'm gonna like it or not because i all virtually always hate like the first 100 150 pages of a new book that i'm reading i mean it's just it's just how i am uh, but once I get past that point, uh, I can make up my mind. I'll I'll have enough invested in the characters and the story to like carry me forward. This was and like un- that. Unless you're reading direct like action thriller, you know, um, every chapter is a you know a cliffhanger. I think that's probably most people's experiences. Um, a lot of you know everything is kind of a slow build, and then you find yourself very very uh, hooked into it. And I felt the same way about this game. And one thing I wanted to say too about the voice acting um you know i didn't get into this until uh, after the voice acting and i think it was a great addition i did find myself as i got further into the game you could hit spacebar to kind of reveal the text because as they're talking you know the text is going along the bottom to like match their uh speech uh, you could hit space to reveal all the text and then you could hit space again to like make them stop talking and go to the next line I did find as I got more and more into the game, um, I just would hit space. I would just like, I read faster than they'll talk mm-hmm. to me. Um, and I would skip a lot of the dialogue of them talking to me. And part of me was like, man, I'm skipping a lot of this dialogue, uh, at least the voice acting of it. And I felt like my first inclination was that it felt like a wasted effort to me that they did all this because I'm skipping a lot of it. Then The more I played it, though, the more I realized that the voices are giving me a character to like instead of just, like, their text. Like, because, you know, when you read something, you're kind of giving your own voice to it, but mostly you're reading everything kind of in your own voice, and it's a lot harder to ascribe, like, personality to uh, just a flat image and text. I I think it was still worth it and probably made the game much better. I came out of this wishing that I had that feature in most movies and TV shows. <laughs> it's like, I wish that I could just like hit this base bar and like, you know, okay, okay finish your sentence. All right. All right. All right. Yeah. On to the next scene. <laughs> yeah, no more exposition. Yeah. I was really pleased though, that there were a couple times where, you know, I had the choice to let the, you know, if someone said a joke that I thought was funny or someone had a word that would be fun in their accent or seemed like a really passionate thing, I knew that I could stop and let them finish the line. Mm-hmm. Um, I could just fast forward through all the exposition, but if um, the music changed, and sometimes the music mm-hmm. changes to a melancholy underscoring, and you know that person is having their Oscar moment. <laughs> <laughs> like They definitely cue it up, and then you can decide whether you're going to let the voice actor do the you know the best moment of their day where they get to have their sob story versus someone who's just explaining the background of plants yeah, <laughs> yeah i mean it, 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 the thousandth line by your main characters i mean that's fine I, I have no problem skipping that at all but i would not skip any of the lines from the lady wrestlers <laughs> <laughs> oh no of and melody not. man melanie and her uh you you, you end up with this lovely white-haired rich lady um, later on in the game, and I just wanted that woman to milk every line of dialogue she had. Oh, yeah. The voice acting really did help the characters get their hooks into me, and really, that's that's what this game is, is a really, it's a delivery mechanism for fun characters. You know, it has an interesting story, um, and there's occasionally some fairly interesting puzzles, but not like, you know, nothing that's going to light the adventure game world on fire. Um, or put Telltale quite out of business or anything like that. But uh, there's a huge cast, huge cast of characters and a really interesting setting. But the key to this whole thing is Turing. Um, You're playing as a journalist in this sort of neo-futuristic cyberpunk version of San Francisco. Um, And your friend, Hayden, uh, who's a uh, some kind of AI researcher, uh, he mysteriously disappears, and his research project, uh, the first 
sapient machine, a little robot buddy named Turing, shows up at your apartment asking for help in finding his creator. And Turing is absolutely a charming design. From head to toe, he's adorable, or I say he, and actually I should say they, because there's a whole matter of, of does gender apply to Turing and how is gender applied generally in this, uh, in this game. But uh, Turing is this head to toe adorable design wonderful voice acting by melissa hutchinson the same person who did the voice of clementine in the walking dead um but even turing didn't completely get his hooks into me their hooks into me until probably uh an hour or two into the game like it takes Mm -hmm. some time for this stuff to really start working on you and you have the choice to tell them that you find them annoying like it's a game that lets you say you're too chatty or get impatient with it. Like it understands that sometimes people are not going to be charmed by the robot who really likes um, Bob Ross <laughs> or trees. Um, and, and you mentioned to the uh, the setting. Uh, it's literally called Neo SF. Um, I, I have to say, I thought as far as games that like predict. A future or just media that predicts a future I thought this was actually um, short of the pure on hybrid thing which we'll talk about yeah I thought this was one of the most likely actual representations of what the future we're talking you know 40 basically 40 45 years uh, from now will look like it's basically just like the internet has expanded to include more things um, and there are cybernetic implants. Now, the stuff that's like a little over the top is like people can basically become like cats, and people can, <laughs> you know, there's a bear that has a like basically like a smart cat. It, it can't talk, but it's basically sentient and can walk around and acts as a butler. Um, but all of their handling of technology, they, I really feel like they, they spent a lot of time building the world and trying to make it make sense within itself. And I thought a lot of the research, or rather the, the, the science that we see of that time, is way more likely than you know what we normally see, which is like, oh yeah, of course in 40 years, we're all gonna be in like flying cars in cloud cities everywhere. Like this was still kind of like, you know, grungy city life. Midboss is, is based out here in the Bay Area, and this really feels like a Bay Area version or view of the future. So it feels like this sort of um, tech bro utopia or dystopia where big tech companies are running the whole world and um, maybe things have culturally gotten sort of advanced. You know, there's there's a it, it makes it clear that this is a world where it's very inclusive of people with different sexualities, gender identities, etc. Genetics Ge- and different genetic. But then there's still robotic these, implants. There's still these new uh, new areas like robotic implants and you know people with with uh, hybrid genetics that people not are not accepting of that. Very accepting of all genders and whatnot. Not accepting of people with robot. Parts. Yeah. <laughs> also, it's a uh, it's a world where this sort of uh, you, you know that sort of bizarre form of uh, libertarianism that a lot of the sort of tech bro guys kind of feel about. Well, it, things will be better if we just build up a bunch of really good tech and privatize the police and privatize the water system and and mm-hmm. that's this world. Like it's this sort of tech bro dystopia that <laughs> and chicago privatized parking and street parking is more expensive than any city so yeah i feel like the uh developers of this game thought about the dystopian parts and the good parts of it and we're kind of like well yeah the bay area is probably going to end up fine because there's enough money there and they said mm-hmm. it here. They're like, but L.A. is screwed. Oh, man. Every time they mention <laughs> L.A., I kind of had a laugh because it's like, man, it, it sounds like a, it sounds like the escape from L.A. Uh, version of L.A. Or um, North yeah. Korea. They posit that there was a, <laughs> uh, a, a massive war in North Korea mm. that basically leveled the country, um, which is a reasonable prediction, I guess. You know, <laughs> they, they, they kind of Jeez. they kind of play out, um, you know, different outcomes and just place you in this world assuming all these things have happened you get some background on it um it's it is a game that is in some ways incredibly heavy in exposition while also in some ways just like expects you to be able to 
pick up where the world is. Yeah. And we didn't mention the the sort of key uh, or at least key in the beginning of the game uh, sort of sci fi futuristic premise, which is that everyone has instead of having a smartphone in your pocket, why not have an enormous bulky robot follow you around? Everyone has these uh, relationship organizational managers or ROMs. Do they not have stairs in the future? I know. These gigantic robots, these things, they look like they look like those little remote controlled cars from the original Star Wars. It's a giant palm pilot. <laughs> they're like they're like Siri, but takes up as much space as your refrigerator. Like, what is the point <laughs> of these things? But but they're hey, cute. everyone has these cute robots that follow them around and answer b- basic questions that an, a Web page could answer for them and occasionally right. get mad at you for asking. <laughs> yeah. But the the premise of the game is that uh, that Hayden, your missing friend, has turned one of these things into a real boy uh, or girl or non gender binary (laughs) creature. And it now needs your help in finding its creator. Um, And I guess we'll leave the rest of the story discussion for after the spoiler break. But um, it didn't immediately grab me, but it is nice to see people experimenting with cyberpunk worlds again. You know, cyberpunk is a little silly, um, and it feels all the sillier the farther we get away from the 80s. But I really like <laughs> cyberpunk aesthetics, and I like... Didn't like, didn't we have a, a nice long conversation about how weird the idea of cyberpunk is on our episode about The Room? <laughs> yes. We did. We did. I think we talked about... Uh, Cyber Scott. I'm trying to remember... Cyberska. Yes, Cyberska. Cyber Steam Ska. <laughs> yeah. Cyberpunk is is cool, right? I mean, it it, it is. I swear. And uh, so I'm glad to see a, another cyberpunk game out there. Um, and I hope we see more of that stuff. Yeah, I I think it's um, worth spending a little bit more time discussing the game's like real drive at uh, a discussion around. Um, gender and what it means to to ascribe gender. I think it might be good to kind of just mention that this game, I mean, we mentioned that it's made by Midboss, but Midboss is a explicitly, like, inclusivity. Midboss is a company that kind of grew out of the, they're the same people, basically, that run the Gamer X convention, uh, which is a gay gamer or just inclusive gamer convention that happens here in uh, in San Jose. I've been once. It was really great. Um, very friendly folks. Uh, they are also kind of known for doing this documentary a few years back called Gaming in Color. Uh, it's a documentary about sort of the, in, you know, the scene of gay gamers. So they really kind of have an explicit message they want to convey here, I think. Uh, and, and it has to do with making a game that's inclusive it's got an inclusive team i think it's an entirely queer team they've got lots of gay and trans uh, game makers on the team and they're wanting to tell a story that is about uh, inclusivity i really wish one of us was gay to uh to to provide some comment here make sure that we're yeah there's there's no comment there but um unfortunately uh what a heteronormative podcast group we have. But <laughs> I, I could say that it fits very well because cyberpunk and AI is all about identity. And let's be honest, like Westworld wasn't questioning gender. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. um, yeah. But AI is always about who am I? And it, it makes sense that in Neo San Francisco that you would be asked, what is your preferred pronoun? Yes, mm-hmm. that would be part of, I mean... Part of my job is making corporations include non-binary gender on forms. I have that argument about once uh, every six months, and I always win it because people go, oh, it's a PR nightmare. I should remove it. <laughs> so it makes sense that robots would have as their setup, what is your preferred pronoun? Yeah. Great. It, and it actually has you pick when you first kind of set what's your character name. Uh, it has you pick your pronouns, and it includes... Um, even the um, the like gender neutral ones. Uh, I'm so sorry if I mispronounce it, but it's Z, Zim, Z and Zer. And, yeah, yeah. Um, which I haven't is cool. seen something and, like this since Fallen London. Yeah. yeah, you can yeah. even input your own, which I think is a nice touch. So if you have your own preference about that that doesn't appear on a, a list of six or eight options, you can you can enter your own, and the game will use them for you. And almost every character that you interact with, or at least a large majority. Um, 
have a unique pronoun that would be uh, different than you expect, I guess, based off of like their design. So it is really, um, it is a major part of the game and it is a conversation. It makes you think uh, about it. You know, some of the major characters are uh, like non-binary or they are, um, so there's a, there's a really real diversity here. And some of the most lovable characters in the game, like for example, absolutely my favorite character in the game is Tom Cat. Um, mm-hmm. maybe excluding Turing, uh, its cell or their self because Turing is super adorable, but like in terms of human characters, Tom cat is just super charming, super lovable. And, um, Tom cat refers to themselves as they, and it took me a little while to, to realize, oh, it, they're using they, uh, or other characters are using they for Tomcat, and I had made my own assumption about Tomcat. I thought Tomcat he, and I mean it is a Tomcat is a f- male yeah. cat, so right, right, makes and, sense. But so it, it took me a while to kind of pick up on. Oh wait, they prefer they. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I I picked up on the same thing eventually, but up until that point, I was thinking she uh, I was because too. of the voice. I thought but, Tomcat yeah. was a yeah, but yeah, I mean or... Tomcat is a just a legit cool character regardless of what pronoun you want to apply to to them it's it, tomcat is a cool super cool super hacker hacker who is a, a southerner Southern like accent. myself so I, which I, I really appreciate them representing <laughs> us uh, i think it's perhaps the only southerner that i've ever seen represented as a brilliant computer hacker yeah. <laughs> who has the worst southern accent on this podcast who has the worst southern accent? I might. I'm the only one who's still currently living in the south. I do declare that I have the very worst southern accent on this podcast. <laughs> oh, yes. Reagan wins. As the only one on the show who's not from Texas, none of you have strong <laughs> southern accents. Oh, I mean, if you were doing one, how bad would oh, it be? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> like, if you were trying to be a Georgia Peach, Nate, how bad would your accent be? No, you go on. You go on ahead. No, I'm just going to sit here and drink my tea. You go on ahead. Uh, it would be a uh, mint the worst. julep. That's the worst. Uh, but that is pretty bad. <laughs> but I, I love Tomcat. And, and the fact that, like, one of these really key characters just, I mean, maybe maybe two hours into the game made me think, oh, wait, right. Okay, I've got it. And I had to, like, recalibrate a little bit. And that's an experience that I think this game wants you to have. You know, it wants you to think about this stuff. It wants to ask you what preferred pronouns do you have. And think about this is something that people should think about. You know, this is the yeah. future where where we're supposed to be beyond this stuff. We need to we need to be in a, a world where people care about what other people. Yeah. How, how other people refer to them and you you know have have the care to to have that consideration for your your fellow human being and it's a very um you know like star trek thing though star trek was <laughs> doing um uh race and um you know just straight up male female uh you know this is doing you know gender identity it, it makes me think of um there's that patrick stewart quote where they asked him uh you know in the future don't th- don't you think they would have a cure for baldness and his response was, well, in the future, no one's going to care about that. <laughs> um, so it, it's like, a, you know, 10 steps past that is what this game is doing. Yeah, I will say this is, despite all the murder, this is pretty G-rated. If you can get around murder. <laughs> yeah. There's not a lot. It, you know, there's a and lot of not, exploration of gender identity, murder. but there's not, or, there's not orgies everywhere. And the murder is 8-bit. So, <laughs> yeah, I know sometimes people hear sexuality exploration and they think, "Oh, this is a really racy game." I just want to yeah, ward that's that a good off. Call. The best. It right. is it's purely just purely dialogue. It's purely dialogue, and the only time it's ever even mentioned because, again, it's positing that if in 2064, everyone just does this. They're not all walking around like, "No, please, correct." Like you didn't say it right. I'm this, I'm this, I'm this. It's just everyone does it and everyone knows it. Um, You might have to ask someone what their preferred pronouns are. um, But once you know it, it's fine. The only time it ever actually comes up as a point to talk about is when Turing is trying to decide their own pronouns. And it's a it's a pretty cool um, bit of dialogue. But this feels like a major part of the game, but it's not actually something that's really ever 
had a had, like put a spotlight on. It's just part of the world. Yeah, it's funny. It's something that's mentioned in every single review. Almost sometimes in like the second paragraph, they start talking about the fact that the game asks you for your pronouns. And after a while, it's feel like, it feels like, oh, this is just how this is just the world of the game. This is just and yeah. in a sense, it's the world that we live in right now. Anyway, you know, ha- give a shit about it, and you know that that's what that's what this game says is give a shit about this and and yeah uh, and then it's not a big deal like what's the big deal when you see those reviews and you see it's like the second thing mentioned well it's because we don't really see the, i can't think of another game maybe some games have like one person who identifies as something else yeah. um and often it's almost like a you know token uh you know trans person or whatever but like this is so much that it forces it into the conversation which must be purposeful yeah i think it just really wants everyone to feel represented in some way in this game and i think it probably achieves that um i I can't speak for everyone but it really it really seems like there's like a really broad range of of characters represented here of all sorts i identify as a polar bear with a thinking cap on so it was very nice to uh (laughs) to get you were represented (laughs) finally very meaningful finally (laughs) Sure. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So we didn't really talk about the visuals of the game and also its music. And this is some of the strongest stuff about the game. The reason that I wanted to play this game, the reason that I, you know, way before the game even came out, I sent an email off to Midboss asking them if they wanted to send us a review code. Um, And it was because of the amazing art. Um, This game, just apart from everything else about it, is visually beautiful. And I guess that's a matter of taste, but I really, really like this style. So this is big, chunky pixels, but with uh, but using these sort of big, chunky pixels to depict really lush scenes. And um, most of the game, you're going to have a kind of a split screen where you've got a beautiful kind of chunky uh, 320 by 240 kind of uh, view of, you know, a street scene or or interior of a, a building or something like that side by side with a character portrait that gives you a real close up and lets you get a, a look a close up look at what those characters faces look like so you get their sort of emotion uh, going on and the closest thing I can describe the art style to is that this is really really a lot like Sega CD games or other kind of um, uh, like it really reads to me like some of the really great pixel art that would have been going on in the sort of late 16-bit era. Uh, yes, the Sega CD, a thing that we all have a direct point of reference to. <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, I actually did have a Sega CD and agree. And, and it's also, um, it's it's interesting because the whole game is played almost in this like viewfinder on your screen. It only takes up, um, it's like a, a rectangle that is maybe only uh, a third or a half of your screen to begin with. And then that is chunked into these, you know, the, the image of the uh, street or whatever. And then the other close up on the portrait. Yeah. And there's some on screen UI and everything. It, it, it feels kind of restricted, but weirdly enough, like I felt that really worked for it. Like it was um, like, you could easily crop off the sides and put this on a four by three television, for example. I mean, it's so focused on dialogue that it makes sense that two thirds of the interface is dedicated to text. Yeah. And yeah. another third is, or a pretty big proportion of it is dedicated to the character portrait of whatever character you're talking to. Mm-hmm. And then the, the actual like scene is a relatively small part of the screen, but the fact that it was so small meant that they had to get creative with the pixel art. And that is just phenomenal. Like they really convey a lot with really minimal um, pixel art. Yeah. And I have to say, too, um, I personally loved this design aesthetic because um, I generally am not super great at like these intense adventure games. Uh, we talked about in the room that the puzzle style of, hey, did you happen to see that thing is like mm-hmm. my least favorite style of puzzle. And this made it significantly easier when everything is a flat screen that you're looking at and it's not like your whole computer screen with a dozen things to click on it's it's one flat image that there might be a lot of things to click on but it's all right there it's all condensed and it only takes you maybe um i mean you can identify everything that is clickable 
uh, if you will, in probably 10 seconds yeah, on and a screen. If you mouse over something and it is interactable, you immediately get a little highlight around it. So it's never trying to like, you never have to pixel hunt uh, on this game. Yeah, exactly. It's it's very effective and um, in, it looks great. I was pretty surprised by it at first, but I immediately was into it. And it, it, it's, it was, I, I haven't seen many games like choose to condense everything down. It almost looks like, you could play the whole game like i bet it would fit on like on an iphone they're they've talked about doing a mobile port of it and they are planning on doing that eventually uh, they put that on hold while they finish the voice acting but uh yeah it that absolutely could run on an iphone one other thing i want to say about the the visual style while we're on the topic is that this is this is a pixel art game that doesn't cheat you know something that for no particularly good reason, but something that bugs me about a lot of modern pixel art games is that they'll create, for example, a character model that, sure, it, it's got the color scheme and chunky pixels of a, say, 16-bit sprite, but then they have it doing things that no 16-bit sprite would or could ever do. So, for example, rotating smoothly in a full 360-degree kind of way or animating in a way that makes it look like a bunch of pixels are now not on a grid anymore they're animating in all sorts of directions you know this sort of fake pixel art sometimes it can still work but it's not authentic but this pixel art is straight up grids every pixel is carefully drawn to a grid and every time the character portraits for example animate you know, you, you get a real sense that somebody was taking loving care over every frame of the animation that they're doing, even though they are maybe, you know, low frame rate, simple animations. So if you love pixel art, this is a absolute tour de force in pixel art. It's super, super good looking. And I want to make sure we talk about the music. Oh, yeah. It is great. Yeah, I, I can't say enough good shit about this music. Uh, Seriously. I, I would. I had times where I was playing the game where I just would just sort of let it play, um, you know, while I did something else, just to let it repeat those damn tunes. Right out really, of the gates. Really good. Right out of the gates. The killer the, theme. The theme song. The whole package. I was into the like tone of this game immediately. You get this like '80s. Uh, you were mentioning like Escape from, uh, you know, New York vibe. Um, the music fit, would fit into like an 80s movie perfectly it also though fits perfectly as like fm synth like console quality you know it, it's it's like a really good soundtrack from an authentic 90s console yeah it really sound has that sega sound to me yeah i don't know i think that's the fm synth sound that you're talking about it, it has kind of really uh like good recreation of instruments in a synthesized way you know it doesn't it doesn't have that early sound of like you know just really good satisfying beeps and boops i don't think there's any sampling on this at all it's absolutely it's got to be like a they did some research to make sure that this would sound like something that could have been at home on a mid-90s sega console just in the same way that they did with the graphics like I said earlier, like I didn't when I first got into the game, you know, I got a few hours in and it was that original version before they added the voice acting and I didn't really carry it through. But I tell you mm -hmm. what, I downloaded the soundtrack and it was on repeat on my I didn't even finish the game at that time. But the, the soundtrack was on repeat on my iPhone for like a couple of months. So it's an amazing soundtrack. And uh, if you get the option to buy the game with the soundtrack included, I think that's an option on Steam and probably also on other stores depending on where you buy the game if you get that option do it because once you get into this game you're going to want to put that soundtrack on your phone and listen to it on repeat yeah it's great forget the game <laughs> <laughs> well and it's very important because uh that i mean that's like a lot of what you get is the sound design and the and the voiceover it had to be good um and there's also like foley sound design somebody running down the street or cars or video you know arcade there's a of course neo sf 2064 of course there'd be a bustling arcade scene like we have today yeah uh you yeah. know so the, the this is a you know this game took care with everything and made sure uh what it was going to focus on looked great and felt mm -hmm. great or sounded great and it's longer everything. than a 
most of the games we cover. So it's it's even more important that we really like the who we're spending time with and we like the ambiance and all the music. Yeah, about eight hours, which is is like not super long, obviously, but we sometimes do episodes on games that are like a couple of hours or less. So eight hours is a relatively long game for the stuff that we cover on this show. Um, but it's yeah. it's a short enough experience that you don't feel like like I don't know if I could handle uh, a 30 hour version of read only memories. But at eight hours, it was pretty much just the right length. Yeah, I mean, that's mm -hmm. like a major thesis point of our show, right? Is that uh, is that these games can bring you a truly unique experience and have it done without wearing out its welcome. And I think this is a, a great example of that. Um, there's one song I wanted to point it out to. I don't know if we can find it on the soundtrack, but there's a arguably terrible scene where you're where you're dealing with a uh, a a like hip hop artist. Oh, geez. Yeah, uh, oh, it's God. probably the it's probably the worst scene in the game. But the music <laughs> it was it was terrible, but uh, it was funny. Yeah. And guy, one spoiler: the song you find out afterwards is called Holabay. <laughs> the whole thing it's so stupid but it uh the music in the background it, it's great it's this like it sounds like a sonic song it's got like like the that when they try to make like a digital recreation of a record scratch you know what i'm talking about <laughs> yeah. Like that, yeah there's like digital hype men in the background it's, it's great So a lot of what made this game uh, so compelling is its story. I mean, we're, we're talking about a uh, very narrative-based game here, and we don't want to go much further into that uh, without giving you an opportunity to go play the game yourself. If you haven't played the game, next up we're going to be talking about uh, the story and some of the surprises therein. So if you haven't played the game, uh, maybe skip ahead to the end or uh, or pause the episode and come back when you've had a chance to uh, to get through the story of the game but here it is this is your spoiler break so read only memories or 2064 has six different chapters and i know that helped me a lot because i kind of knew how fast i was progressing and the early ones are very expository very much introducing the problem you go to hayden's apartment you look around um and then you start getting a little more openness for example at one point you can choose whether you want to follow a media story or if you want to follow a tech story and i started off with media what did you guys do i did the tech side it's interesting it, it seems like it's got this one major branch in the middle i guess it's in chapter three mm -hmm. i don't know if it affected anything so i'm curious what happened to you depending on what choice you make your chapter three will be tech or media, and then your chapter four will be the one that you didn't pick. That's the best I can yeah. tell. But uh, but I think different stuff occurs depending on which order you take it in. Yeah. So what happened to you? I went to the uh, the tech side of things first, and that meant that basically all the media characters ended up dying. Oh, that happens um, if you choose media first anyway. Oh, everyone yeah. okay. dies no matter what. It is a spoiler break. <laughs> I mean, the major path here, right, is that you figure out Hayden has been... Well, first, Hayden's missing. And the first two chapters are, what happened to Hayden? And through a lot of work with Tom, Tomcat and a bunch of elite hacking skills and various interactions with the underground, you find out that ha Hayden has been murdered. And then you basically are dropped with, like, no more leads right it's or no more like hard things to follow and it's just kind of like you're kind of following a couple sketchy leads trying to see what um see what your best see if you can figure out anything and it's kind of a weird spot in the game um i haven't really felt many like detective games where it's like okay we don't know anything now they normally scale right you're like constantly getting deeper and getting deeper and getting deeper and this feels like an almost restart it is kind of weird, yeah. And, and I, it's kind of effective, too. Um, you have two the two flimsy leads, either going after the media or going after the tech, um, to basically now the, the scope has expanded. You're not just trying to figure out, uh, you know, what happened to Hayden. 
well, you know, you're trying to figure out why was Hayden murdered? He He's not a bad dude. He's actually, by all accounts, a super rad dude, and everyone really liked Hayden, and he obviously is a genius. He created the first AI, uh, and now it's become, like, corporate espionage. And uh, I guess this is where the game kind of branches, but I, I have to imagine that this is sort of like a dishonored thing where... Um, a and B are the same, you know, how you get to them are going to maybe be a little bit different, but I doubt that there's very much difference in the, like the major plot points. Yeah. I think you hit all the major plot points either way. There are four endings and I only know that because we've looked it up. Um, I got what apparently is, I guess the good ending. And I think that's probably also the easiest ending to get if you're treating everyone with respect and, trying to be friends with your robo buddies yeah i was surprised to find out that you can get a you're a dick ending which is that um turing turns on you and takes over the world kind of yeah i mean to, yeah. to be fair almost every dialogue tree there's an option for you to be a dick so oh, I'm yeah. not, that's true i'm not too su too surprised that there is the um bad outcome because you're an asshole to everyone i mean literally every time that you talk to uh lexi there's an option to make fun of her by saying things like wow what's new pussycat or uh ooh, put oh, away jess, your claws yeah. jess or, jess <laughs> oh excuse me yeah. jess i'm mixing up the name sorry yeah that jess is the uh is the um cat appearing hybrid uh lawyer and obviously i was i was not playing that sort of jerk and so i was not making the cat puns in every single possible dialogue Just choice. Once or twice. I kind of wish that I could have in order to see what that side of things, uh, how, how things played out with her. And I imagine there's similar options with a lot of the other characters. Like if you, if you want to be a jerk to everybody, including the lovable robot buddy Turing, uh, you can, and it does have some effect. And those other, those other endings seem a little darker. There's also a little bit of like, who do you trust? And I actually, mm -hmm. I don't say I won't say I went hard on this, but I for the most part chose the options that were not trusting uh, Doctor Fairlight. So Me too. I, was, mm -hmm. I was a little bummed when uh, I that seemed to have no effect on the the ending for me, where it, you know, yeah. Uh, but I guess it's because Doctor Fairlight isn't necessarily the bad dude; it's his assistant, you know, as we find out. But um. Yeah, he seemed, he seemed pretty weird from the start. I doubt there's a way where you can get it. I mean, there can't be a way where you can get it where Decker isn't there with you at yeah, the end. Yeah, it seemed like there was a choice whether to bring him along or not. I don't and think I thought, you can, because I tried to resist pretty hard. and then, That's like, the whole ending, is dealing with it. Um, and then Turing's like, you have a 17% chance, a uh, better chance of winning if you take him along or bringing him. Okay, yeah. Turing. But I, I thought the the scale of this game was pretty interesting and i thought they handled it really well i mean it is so much dialogue but to go from a um you know it starts as a mystery or a missing person you know mystery to a murder mystery to a everyone's getting murdered mystery yeah to a massive yeah. like a serial killer mystery to a espionage like corporate espionage mystery to a uh big brother like a company is actually going to take over the world in a way. Um, and it all comes to a down Terminator to movie. Yeah. To a Terminator movie. Um, it hits a lot of things. And I, it was, I think easily the second half of this game is significantly better than the first half. And that's not to say that the first half is bad by any means, but I was far more engaged in the game. Once we got to this part of it. Yeah, I think if for me, the thing that really got engaging at the end was just sort of like I started becoming attached to the characters. I don't actually think that the last half of the game has significantly better like mechanics or anything like that. You know, it, it, it's still pretty much a point and click visual novel. Mm -hmm. um, but once you get attached to the characters, that style starts working for you. You know, it's a bit like sitting down and watching uh, you know, a TV show or something like that where you enjoy the characters. It doesn't matter that it's minimally interactive. It matters that you you enjoy spending 
time with these characters. Yeah, but they also do just include more interaction in the second half, and and I think the first half might have benefited from that a little bit. There's, like, more better... And puzzles aren't really even the right word for it, but there's, like, more better things for you as the... Yeah, mini-games, exactly, for you, to the player, to do. And I found myself early in the game kind of torn. Part of me was like, why do I even... Like, this should be a movie, you know, mm-hmm. like I, this should be something that I don't even have to interact with. Can I hit auto? Can I like set up one of those little birds that just pecks and it just hits space for me? You know, when dialogue is done, I actually had the same sort of feeling about this at that point, because I, right now, I, you know, in my long game world, I'm playing um, uh, Tokyo Mirage Sessions, which is a, a JRPG. And it has a feature that I really like. It has some fairly long dialogue sequences, but there's a button you can hit that will just automatically advance the dialogue as soon as each character finishes their lines, yeah. turning it into a, turning each of these fairly lengthy cutscenes into a bit of a movie. Mm-hmm. And I really, really wanted that feature. I felt like this game was caught in between. It's like I wanted either more puzzles or none at all. You know, I wanted it just to tell me what was happening or to like really be more involved. And I thought that that the second half. It, yeah. it had a better balance of me being involved as a player or at least seemingly involved with more choices. Where do I go? I can do this or I can do this. Mm-hmm. Whereas the first half was just a lot of like, okay, hit space. Um, now, I will say they did some really cool things in the first half training you for the last half. Um, mm-hmm. You know, there's the arcade game. Did you guys play Mega Phob- yeah. Phobanger? Yeah, yes. Um, and I loved yeah. that it came around at the end. Yeah, and they, the like one of the guys at the arcade is like, "Oh, you better go beat that." So I was like, "Okay, I'll go play it." And I, you know, and I and I won at Mega Phobator. And then of course it's a thing at the end, or there's that little mu- mini game where you are trying to redirect the the teens, which we haven't not talked about yet. Um, you have to the redirect punk the teens. teens. Yeah, the Ooh, lo- punk teen lovers. Punk teen mm-hmm. lovers and. One of their names is Starfucker, and and it's a great name, but it's also a great band. Have you guys ever listened to the band Starfucker? Yes, I have. I love it that It is a band. great band. And Endorse I, the band Starfucker. We do. I, they're There's fantastic. our explicit right there. Yeah, right. I know. No, it's it's one word. It's not a bad word. It's The word is Starfucker. Uh, so, um, it's a proper it's, name. They, they do make a Chat. very... They do make a, a pretty heavy joke about that, though. Um, what oh, is it? It's, they do. it's Starfucker and Ollie. He said, "Well, that's because you're not a star yet." And Ollie just gets real uncomfortable. He's like, "But well, yeah. we haven't even." Oh, yeah. Aww. yeah. Aww. Um, Those poor boys. Yeah, they're good boys. I think is an option. Good boys. That's an option you <laughs> you get to say yeah. is your opinion on them. Um, I did get to say they're good boys. Yeah. So. I agree. so I thought that was really cool. A lot of the little things that you kind of touch on at the beginning become really important at the end. And that's part of what made the end, I thought, uh, fun was all the actual interaction. So I kind of wish the first half had more of that. I wanted to use the headphones to solve a puzzle. And I'm real and sad. And you carry those things with you everywhere. And you can use it on everything. I use them on everything. And I thought it was going to be helpful. And it just played me ads. Yeah, it's a setup for a bunch of jokes. Or um, to listen to, like, the soundtrack, which you can link it with various things to play songs. Speaking of spoilers, I carry that bag of spoiled milk from the fridge everywhere and used it on every object. And I found three places to use them. And I used them in two. And I know you used them in the other one. I didn't even... So this is so in the very beginning of the game, apparently, if you go into the, uh, the fridge, there's a... Uh, a carton of spoiled milk. I did not find this, and so I missed out on all of this. So you have to explain it to me. You just pick it up and you keep it, and you keep trying to put it on things over and over the entire game. And the game's like, that's a terrible idea. Reagan, <laughs> I'm terrible at adventure games, and I knew to click on every single thing in the starting, you know, room. How did you not click and inspect every single thing in the bedroom at the first option? I'm going to blame the fact that I had already played through the first couple of hours of the game. Um, and knew it didn't already, matter before if you'd already and played so you i knew i didn't known. need it yeah. yeah i don't know uh, but uh <laughs> I, I missed out on that so what happens with, with the milk? in the fridge is the spoiled milk and um for me i only found one direct spot to use it it will not let you use it it just makes a ton of puns yeah <laughs> it, 
you can try you can try to interact with the milk on just about every item that's in the game and the only time i ever used it successfully was like five hours into the game and this is the first item that you pick up other than the headphones which are just part of like Mm -hmm. the exposition and there's an opportunity where you have to bring coffee to someone and sympathy yeah yeah sympathy and they very clearly i mean they put it on a tee for you they say here's the coffee she likes it with lots of milk she she likes it with a lot of milk here's the milk right so it's like i I felt so bad because sympathy is a really nice character she's just trying to do her job you know and you're on good relation you're on good terms she's kind of railroading you a little bit blocking you from doing what you you're supposed to do but i mean you get it you know and but there's this opportunity to put spoiled milk in her coffee instead of regular milk and i had this moral dilemma because i'm like (laughs) i knew this is the chance to use the spoiled milk i've been carrying it with me for like five and a half hours i thought it was the only chance i've learned since from laura that there's other opportunities for it I thought it was the only chance. It's just like, I don't like as a person that this is the choice that I'm making, but as a video game player, this is the choice I have to make. And so I put the spoiled milk in the coffee instead of the regular co- uh, regular milk, and it leads to um, sympathy getting a really bad stomach ache almost immediately. Not Somehow she doesn't recognize that it's from like the gross coffee she just drank, uh, but she leaves to run to the bathroom and that gives you an extra opportunity to talk to um, Charlie Nova uh, and, you know, get more information. But I guess there's other opportunities to use it. Or I, how did you guys get to talk to Charlie Nova more giving her not spoiled coffee? I just, I gave her coffee with milk in it. Like, there's a milk next to the coffee, so I just yeah. poured the milk in and then gave it to her, and she was like, well, I guess you're nice enough now that you've given me coffee. Oh, that makes <laughs> like, me feel worse. She- okay. <laughs> 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 you don't have to the poison show. her. Yeah. So I will say there's two other places that I found to use it. One is all the way at the end, you hook Turing into the big machine in the server. Like it, you, you, Instead of hooking him in... You can use the milk on the port and just crash the machine. What? And, <laughs> and I, I definitely saved. I was like, I saw, I clicked on it and I was like, what if I put the milk in here? And I like saved the game. <laughs> and then I poured, <laughs> and then I double checked it was saved. And then I poured the spilled milk. And I, every other time, it just makes a joke. This time it actually lets you pour it in. The whole machine shorts out. Turing's like, why the hell would you pour spilled milk into the Big Brother database? We and just spent yells, a whole game trying to get to this point. Yeah. And, then <laughs> and then he yells really big, you spoiled everything. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> and the game cuts off and it's like, your adventure has been cut short, but you can rewind because there's definitely no reason you want to do this. That's so I rewound. Funny. Ended the game properly, played through the credits, and then the um, there's an endless Christmas thing. So I end the game with it still in my inventory. And then Turing's like, Merry Christmas, I made you this abstract painting. And then you have the choices of like, I didn't get you anything. Or, oh, I got you this dot 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 and when you click it you give him the spoiled milk (laughs) and then he like freaks out and he puts it back in the fridge that's pretty funny (laughs) so spoiled milk it's a heavy part of this game i'm still really glad that i just had the idea at the very end of the game like what if i just spilled spoiled milk all over the server at the very end of the game i'm really sad yeah i'm really sad i didn't try because what's funny is so when you use the spoiled milk on the coffee, it removes it from your inventory. It's gone. Mm. And then you can go back to the fridge and get more. So I had <laughs> more spoiled milk. So I'm like, oh, clearly there's other there's opportunities. There's more stuff to do. Yeah, there's more it's stuff not to done. do. But at that point, at the end, I was too invested in the uh, – because I had done the same thing. I had been – every opportunity I had to put spoiled milk on something I was trying. And uh, – I'm sad that I missed the climax of the game. <laughs> it gives you the opportunity to put the spoil, 
Boiled milk on it. It's a great touch. I mean, uh, it's the, the funniest designers. thing you possibly could do is like, again, I was trying to put the spoiled milk in every plant on every, oh, car, sure. every car, like literally trying to put the spoiled <laughs> milk on every object in the game. And I am so excited. Every person trying to give him the spoiled milk, like just like I knew it had to be used as a joke somewhere. And something lovely about this is that it does give you text in most of these cases. Even if you're doing something with objects that doesn't make any sense, it, it somebody took the time to write out at least a couple of sentences. And if they could muster it, a joke for everything that you can try with various objects in this and game. And most of them are uh, have repeated text where, like, if you go up to a car and you, like, touch the car, it's like, hey, you should probably not touch that car. And you touch the car again, and I'm like, what are you doing, trying to start a riot? And then you touch the car again. It, it has, like, five lines of dialogue that lets you go through, similar to, like, an old Warcraft game where you just, like, keep clicking on the guy until he gets annoyed by you clicking on the guy. I believe I got a achievement called Farewell, Old Friend. You finally found a use for it. Oh, nice. <laughs> nice. nice. Did you guys drink every uh, type of Hassie? Oh, I probably tried like 30 or 40 different types of Hassie. There's an achievement for trying all the Hassie. Uh, I did try all the Hassie, and I love the little Hassie that comes up Hassie. every time. Every time you uh, Hassie is brought up. I didn't want to spoil it earlier when we were talking about... Uh, voice acting but i thought that the guy who played decker was fantastic and oh yeah the, the robot decker was one of the few characters that i just let talk the whole time because i thought he did such a good job with it yeah he nailed it a lot of the voice acting was really good although one complaint i would have about it is that it is a little uneven uh the the cast is huge and uh, it's a mix of professional voice actors and folks who are not professional voice actors, um, but are interesting for one for other reasons. And sometimes those non-pro voice actors work really well, and other times I don't think they're used really particularly correctly. Yeah. For example, like I'm a big fan of Jim Sterling as a YouTuber. He's he's really funny, and I think his takes are good. Um, but uh, his they had him do the voice of, and he's he's like a charming guy um and he's he, they they put him in as the uh as the head of the human revolution uh you know he's this sort of anti-hybrid bigot i guess but very and it's just a weird choice that's true but it's just a weird i don't know it, that for some reason it didn't work in my opinion um i'm sure that you know, it probably was what they were going for, but it just, it didn't quite work. And there were other places where I thought like the, the voice casting was kind of weird or off. It just, well, I just seemed odd. I think what it was, and I could be way wrong on this, but it seemed to me that the recording equipment varied a lot between the mm. people that recorded. Um, Turing and the main characters always sounded very full and mm -hmm. sounded great, but some of these like side characters like if you go like to the bouncer and they're like welcome to stardust come on in it sounds like recorded kind of like far away and it just there was like unevenness in the tone or, or at least like the levels of the people yeah that were something recorded. i think about that is that i think that they had uh some of their uh like friends and kickstarter backers and things like that record lines for various sort of more minor characters yeah and so they just might not have been in the best situation for recording some of them may not have had like great mic technique or something yeah. like that it did feel a little weird to have like voices that didn't sound like they were in the same space it, i thought it was pretty noticeable it didn't really it would take me out in that moment um it's not something that necessarily like you know we're this far into the episode to talk about um but yeah, I thought it was pretty noticeable when there was somebody who was probably just recorded three lines on their computer, you know, through Skype for the show or for the game, rather mm -hmm. than I have to imagine they had, um, you know, uh, what the the woman who played Clementine uh, and Turing was probably a either she has her own recording studio, which is probably the most likely thing, or she was in mm -hmm. a studio for them. Um, it's just noticeable um and not, i don't even i don't even think to like a trained ear i bet if you put them next to each other anyone would have noticed um but i get it it's also a small company and to say that like uh hey you should have had you know professional level voice acting for everything is a little unreasonable but also they did decide to do it so 
Yeah. You know, and like particularly because like this is a game with an unbelievable amount, like for for what amounts to an eight hour game. This has, I think, something like 10 plus hours, hours of just recorded audio. Um, And that is a lot like you can compare this in terms of just the amount of voice acting that had to be done to like probably 30 hour games. I will say the only disappointment I had in that front is there were chunks at the end where people had lots of dialogue that was not voiceovered. Um, And I sure it was because of branching, but it was really sad towards the end when we were in like in the sewers, we were in the mess and for Turing to not be saying the lines felt very odd yeah there were just like a handful of places for that i I wonder what the reason for that was were they just lines that got missed during recording or were they things that like maybe there's some branching in the paths that that meant that they just couldn't accommodate all the different options with i voice get acting not or naming all the drinks or like the drink recipes that's totally fine to not have that be voiceover but at the end of the climax felt really odd yeah to have turing have her like crazy or their very long um you know speech about trees which was charming and great and then yeah not to have like a a plot specific and purposeful line at the end it it the the silence was noticeable um and it dropped the tone even though like i said i skipped a lot of the dialogue of them talking it just was very noticeable to have it for the majority of the game through every branch and then to not have it it had to, my guess yeah. is it's a budget thing, but it's weird for it to be so linear. Like if you if you knew you had a budget problem, cut it out at the beginning when it's less important and put it at the end when it's more noticeable. And I mean, you know, more of Turing's voice is always better because Turing is the cutest. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um but overall, I mean, I think that if we're trying to like like recommend this game, I I highly do. But I, I could you have to give it a little bit of time to get into it and and know what you're getting into. Yeah, know you're getting into a like a eight hour uh, visual novel and not some kind of like uh, puzzle heavy adventure game with lots of, you know, real head scratcher puzzles in it or something. It's it's like watching a movie that is set in Ireland and there's really heavy accents and you need to give yourself like five to ten minutes to see if you can understand the accents because you're not going to for five minutes. You got to f- custom your ear, figure out if you're going to like this movie, and then based on the merits. I feel like it's the same thing with this game, but with pacing. You got to figure mm-hmm. out what pace you're going to get through it and then see if you're going to like it. And give the characters an opportunity to get those hooks into you. Like, mm-hmm. I really feel like this is a game that takes some time because it relies so much on your developing affection and interest in the you know what happens to the characters and right off the bat it doesn't have that i mean turing is an instantly cute design but in the first couple of scenes they're a robot and they're a little bit robotic in their interactions with you and so it takes some time for it to for it to kind of warm up yeah ultimately i think i said this right when i was done is like i am really glad i played this game i don't know where it ranks you know in like my favorite games that we've done but i really really am glad that i played this it's it's unlike anything that i've played before at least for the show especially um and i I would recommend it i don't think it's going to be a lot of people's favorite games but uh if you're this far into the show and you haven't played it uh, then you probably will like it because we've been talking about it for a while. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. And if you aren't sure if something like a visual novel style game works for you, this is a good place to start because as visual novels go, this is a real short one. You know, I played um, Danganronpa last year and uh, while I really, really liked it, it was, I think, like 25 hours and that's a short visual novel. Yeah, this for is more like a, a visual novella. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So if you're not sure if that style of gameplay works for you, give this one a try. It's a good place to start, probably. And it looks great. It sounds great. The characters are fun. It's warm. It is very enjoyable to be around. At times it's delightful. At times there's a lot of people dying, but then there's delightful things that happen right afterwards. Um, Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's silly. If you classify fun as having like a bunch of 
things to do that are going to give you a lot of that, like, yeah, you know, addictive video game feedback stuff. from games. <laughs> yeah. Like, you're not going to get a lot of that, like, addictive feedback that you get from video games, from a lot of video games, but you're going to get a different kind of enjoyment out of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. It's, it's a, it feels like a throwback to some sort of false starts or, like, uh, uh, dead ends of a video game evolution. Visual novels as a style are still a thing, still pretty popular in Japan, but almost not at all here. We got a few of them. If you look back at the 90s, like Snatcher came over and it got fully translated. It got a release on disc on uh, uh, the uh, Sega CD, and it was well regarded at the time, but it didn't sell because Americans, I guess, didn't want to read large amounts of text off of their television screens in the 90s. And no, no one man. in this country really makes those <laughs> games. <laughs> yeah. Um, that style of games, you know, whereas in uh, Japan, things like uh, like the Famicom, uh, what's it called? Famicom Tante Club or whatever. There's like a whole lineage of like mystery solving uh, text based adventure games that are very different from the Western style of adventure game and, and more like this. It's a it's a big style over there that had a lot of success. And so it can feel very unfamiliar uh, to a Western audience, particularly if you haven't played the like handful of this style of games that actually did make it over, like the, um, the Phoenix Wright games, for example. So, you know, if you're uh, if you're not sure if this is a style that works for you, this is a good place to start. Or I'd say maybe Phoenix Wright if you uh, if you want to try something else. But yeah, um, I'm glad to play it. I really was uh, excited to try it out. And while it had a little bit of hump right at the beginning, once I was past that initial like barrier, um, I really, really loved the characters and really yeah. loved the story. Yeah, me too. I'm super glad to have played it. So thank you so much for joining us on this episode of The Short Game. Uh, I've been your host, Reagan Kelly, and you can find me on Twitter at Reagan K. That's R-A-Y-G-A-N-K on Twitter. Or you can find the show on Twitter at underscore short game. We love to hear from you. So let us know uh, what you're playing and if you have any suggestions on short games that we might be missing. You can also let us know on our website, www.theshortgame.net, where we've got a contact form. Or if you feel generous, please leave us a review on iTunes. They are the best way to support the show. We don't have a Patreon or any of that sort of business at the moment. So if you want to let us know that you're enjoying the show or help spread the show, tell a friend, leave an iTunes review. Um, thanks to my co-hosts, Laura Nash. Where can people find you? You can find me on Twitter at Laura J. Nash. And Shane, where can people find you? Over on Twitter at 8BitShane. And Nate, where can people find you? Guess what? Also on Twitter at NateSTL. And thank you so much for joining us on this episode of The Short Game. <laughs>